begin this episode by reading from that section of the AD 451's Chalcedonian Creed that's devoted to the Orthodox view of Christ. We find there this. We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, of a rational soul and body, consubstantial with the Father according to the Godhead, and consubstantial with us according to the manhood, in all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these later days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. The distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, and one, the only begotten, God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning declared concerning him, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. Now, I want to ask you to compare those 205 words to the 75 of the Apostles' Creed quoted by most Christians from memory 300 years before. There we find, I believe in... Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. That's quite a difference. What moved church leaders to draw up such exacting language regarding who Jesus was between the 2nd and mid-5th centuries? Well, that's the subject of this and the next episode. Along the way, we will encounter some interesting developments in the church and some rather colorful characters. In the 16th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, we read of a time when Jesus asked his disciples, in effect, what are people saying about me? Who do they think that I am? After hearing the, what the popular talk was, Jesus put the query to them. Who do you say I am? And that set the stage for Peter to confess his faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Now we might assume that Jesus' affirmation of Peter's reply would forestall further controversy. It didn't. It turns out it was only the beginning. In modern times, while non-Christians have mixed ideas on who and what precisely Jesus was, most Christians have settled in on a belief in both the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ. One person, two distinct natures. It comes as something of a surprise to discover that in the early centuries, it was Christians who debated how to understand just who and what Jesus was. The controversy raged for nearly 500 years as church leaders wrestled with how to understand him, or maybe it would be better to say they struggled in how to express in words a biblically faithful understanding of Jesus. Now, we've already dipped a toe into this subject in previous episodes and promised that we'd return to deal with it specifically in future episodes. And this is it. Here's why we need to slow down and take our time reviewing the history of the controversy over how to understand who Jesus was. We need to camp here for a bit because this issue consumed a good amount of the church's intellectual energy during the 4th and 5th centuries. Today we accept the orthodox view of the Trinity and the nature of Jesus as God and man pretty readily, not realizing the agony early church fathers endured while they labored over precisely how to put it in just the right words what Christians believe. It's been said that theology is the fine art of making distinctions, and nowhere is that more clear than here in our examination of how orthodox theologians described Christ, that is, the incarnation of God the Son. 
Now, as we're all familiar with this by now, the first great ecumenical council was held at Nicaea in 325 at the urging of the Emperor Constantine. Some 300 bishops representing the entire church world attended to hammer out their response to Arianism, the idea that Jesus was human but not divine. As the council dragged on, Constantine, itching to get back to the business of running an empire, pressed the bishops to adopt a statement that affirmed Jesus as both God and man. But many of those bishops left Nicaea discontented with the wording of the Nicene Creed. They felt that it was imprecise. It failed to capture the full truth of who Jesus is. Now, this lack of support for the Nicene Creed opened the door for many of the later controversies that rack the church. The Council of Chalcedon, 125 years later, tightened up the language on Nicaea, but it didn't fundamentally alter the creed. So let's take a look at the time between Nicaea and Chalcedon. Sometimes, in an attempt to bring clarity to a complex situation, we can oversimplify, and I run the risk of doing that here. For the sake of brevity, I beg the listener's indulgence as I chart the path from about 325 in the Council of Nicaea to 451 and the Council of Chalcedon. Following Nicaea, with the affirmation that Jesus is both God and man, the church had to first harmonize that with the biblical reality that there's one God, not two. And hold up, someone said, what about the Holy Spirit? Doesn't the Bible say he's also God? Now, the classic Orthodox statement of the Trinity, that God is one in substance or essence, but three in persons, it wasn't something that everyone immediately agreed to. It wasn't like at the Council of Nicaea, they took a vote and agreed that Jesus is both deity and humanity. And then someone raised their hand and said, um, isn't there just one God? Oh, yes, correct. Well, then how do we describe God? And they kind of waited in silence for 14 seconds till someone said, how about this? We'll say that God is one in substance and three in person. They all smiled, nodded, slapped that guy on the back and said, good one. There it is, the Trinity. Our work's done here. Let's go for pizza. No, it, it took a while, a long while to get the wording right. What made it difficult is that they were working in two languages, Greek and Latin, a formulation that seemed to work in Greek was hard to bring over into Latin or vice versa. It took the work of the Cappadocian fathers, Basil the Great of Caesarea, his younger brother Gregory of Nyssa, and their close friend Gregory of Nazianzus to work out the right wording that satisfied most of the bishops and framed the classic Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity. Now, the Council of Constantinople was called in 381 to make this Trinitarian formulation official. This was just a year after the Emperor Theodosius had declared Christianity the official state religion of the Roman Empire. So, with that piece of important theological business out of the way, they moved on to the next great topic. And this is where it gets messy. If Jesus is both God and man, how are we to understand that? Does he have two natures, or does he have one of the natures that trumps the other? Or maybe there's a third way. Did the human and divine natures fuse into a new hybrid nature? And if Jesus is a hybrid, do Christians get to drive in the carpool lane? <laughs> Different camps put forward their scheme and fought hard to see their doctrinal formulation become the official position of the church. The Council of Ephesus in 431 came out with a position that elevated one nature, while the Council of Chalcedon 20 years later altered that by affirming Jesus' two natures. It became obvious to church leaders after the Council at Constantinople that the turmoil that they saved in solving the problem of the Trinity was just adding to the Christological problems that rose next. To understand how this issue was settled, we need to take a look at a rivalry that grew between two churches, a rivalry that was sparked in large part by Christianity being liberated from persecution and elevated to the darling of the state. Those two churches were Alexandria and Antioch. The debate over how to understand the person and the natures of Jesus was staged in the Eastern Empire. The West wasn't as involved because Rome simply did not see as much of a challenge on its beliefs in the dual nature of Christ. 
So while it wasn't the scene of so much theological turmoil, it did play an important part in how the controversy was settled. Political rivalry between Alexandria and Antioch had been going on for some time. Being in the East, both churches vied with each other to provide bishops to Constantinople, which was the new Rome, the political center of the entire Eastern Empire. Getting one of their bishops promoted to the capital meant, well, it meant bragging rights and could result in additional power and prestige for the Alexandrian or Antiochian sees. Two bishops from Antioch that were drafted by Constantinople were John Chrysostom, who we've already looked at, and Nestorius, who we will look at. In addition to their ecclesiastical jealousy was the very different cultural and theological traditions in play at Antioch and Alexandria. The church at Antioch had closer ties to their Jewish roots in Jerusalem. It had a stronger tradition of rational inquiry. It was at Antioch that church leaders had dug deeply into the Old Testament to find many of the great types that pointed to Jesus. They studied scripture through the lens of literal interpretation, rejoicing that God became man in the person of Jesus. The church at Alexandria was different. It grew up under the influence of philosophical Judaism, as seen in someone like Philo, and then passed on to scholars like Clement and Origen. The Alexandrians had a tradition of contemplative piety, as we might expect from a church that was near the Egyptian desert, where the hermits got their start, and had been such standout heroes of the faith for generations. Now, in interpreting scripture, the church at Alexandria developed and was devoted to the allegorical method. This saw the truest meaning of scripture to be the spiritual realities hidden in its literal historical words. While the leaders at Antioch saw Jesus as God come as man, at Alexandria they agreed Jesus was a man. But his divine nature utterly overwhelmed the human so that he effectively had a single operative divine nature. The differences between Antioch and Alexandria had already surfaced in their different approaches to refuting the error of Arianism. That they never reconciled them set the stage for the acrimony to renew over the debate on the nature of Jesus. The Arians made much of those New Testament passages that seemed to suggest Jesus' subordination to God the Father. They like to quote what we know as John 4.28, where Jesus said, The Father is greater than I. And also Matthew 24, verse 36, where he said, No one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, in reply to the Arians, the theologians at Alexandria argue that such passages were properly applied to the Son of God in his incarnation. The theologians of Antioch took a different route, referring such passages not to Jesus' deity, but to his humanity. That may seem like splitting semantic hairs. I say potato, you say potato. But our friends in Antioch and Alexandria thought it an issue of major importance. Really, both approaches provided a defense of Nicene theology, a refutation of Arianism, and a framework for interpreting the Gospels. And this is where I need to simplify, lest we get into the minutia of theologians with too much parchment, ink, and time. In summary, the Alexandrian approach recognized Jesus as God, but tended to diminish his humanity. The Antiochian approach readily embraced Jesus as humanity, but it had a hard time explaining how his human and divine natures related to each other. Now, let me try to make this more practical by bringing up something that maybe you've grappled with. Have you ever pondered how Jesus could be tempted in all points as we are, as it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15? Yet because he was God, it was impossible for him to sin? Sometimes you'll hear it put this way. Was Jesus really tempted since as God, he couldn't sin? As a man, he had the potential to sin, but as God, he couldn't. So was his experience of humanity genuine? Now, if you can relate to that quandary, the question that it poses, you get an idea of the challenges the Antiochans faced. The difference between Antioch and Alexandria on how to understand Jesus was why Arianism and the Nicene Creed kept coming up 
in the Christological controversies dominating the 4th and 5th centuries. Each side thought the other was selling out to Arianism. The battle between the two churches came to a head in the 5th century in the war that took place between two men, Bishop Cyril of Alexandria and Bishop Nestorius of Antioch, who ended up becoming the bishop at Constantinople. But that's the subject for our next episode. As just about every other person with a YouTube channel, I'd sure appreciate it if you'd let others know and invite them to check out Into His Image. Now, I recently started a biblical worldview series of quick takes on current events. It's called Short Takes. You can find them here on the Into His Image YouTube channel. Thank you.